Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto Series by Thomas Plunkett. Today we're going to talk about some additional token standards beyond the ERC-20. ERC-223 and ERC-777 were attempts to improve ERC-20. Um, and ERC-721 is the first non-fungible token standard. So let's dive into those token standards. Um, just a reminder that this uh, slide deck is made available under Creative Commons, and I'd like to thank Andreas and Gavin for providing, making their content for Mastering Ethereum also available under the same license. Okay, so here is the ERC-223 uh, proposed token standard. Uh, the ERC-223 uh, token standard attempt to solve the problem of inadvertent transfer of tokens to a contract that may or may not support the tokens by detecting whether or not the destination address is a contract or not. So this is essentially solving one of the drawbacks of ERC-20. You know, normally with, um, if you're sending ETH to a contract, a contract will have a way to handle ETH, but a contract by default doesn't have a way to handle tokens. So this is going to detect whether or not uh, a uh, an address is a contract or not. So ERC-223 requires contracts designed to accept tokens, implement a function called uh, token fallback, which is gonna be used. If the destination would transfer a contract and the contract doesn't have support for tokens, i.e. it doesn't have this token fallback function, then the transfer will fail. So to detect whether the destination address is a contract, the ERC-223 reference implementation uses a segment of inline bytecode. Um, so we can see it right here. Um, you know, you can see this assembly keyword and then the open curly brace and the closed curly brace. So, um, and what this does is this retrieves the size of the code that's at this target address. And the, you can't do that by, uh, by default in Solidity. So to do it, you really have to write assembly code. And so if the length is greater than zero, we know it's a contract uh, and it's true. Uh, you know, if, if length is greater than zero and it's true, then we know it's a contract. Uh, if the length equals zero, that means there's no code at the address and therefore it's not a contract. So pretty neat way to detect whether something's a contract or not. This you could also use something like this if you're worried about you know, the re-entry attacks we talked about previously. Uh, to detect whether you're actually sending uh, tokens or ETH to an address versus sending it to a wallet versus sending it to um, you know a contract that can do potentially malicious things. So here's a look at the interface for the ERC. 223 token. It's got a number of functions, pretty similar to the ERC20 uh, functions, you know, name, symbol, total supply, transfers, and so on. All right, ERC777 is another attempt to solve some of the problems with the ERC20. Um, some of the goals of ERC777 were listed here, you know, offering ERC20 compatible, but you know, transfer tokens uh, using a send function similar to Ether transfers, be compatible with ERC-820 for token contract registration, and allow tokens and addresses to control which tokens they send through a special tokens to send function that's called prior to sending. Um, and also to basically, an, uh, you know, ERC-777 has this concept of operators where we're going to allow operators to handle the tokens on our behalf and move them on our behalf. Um, and why you might want to do that, well, that might come in handy with, um, you know, an initial coin offering uh, if you don't want to have to do all the movement yourself. So basically using, uh, letting proxies handle uh, sending and receiving tokens on your behalf. Uh, ERC-777 also provides uh, capabilities for minting and burning the tokens, which is pretty popular. So here's a look at the ERC-77 contract interface specification. You know, normal functions like total supply, balance at an address, sending, and then we have all this operator stuff, like authorizing an operator, revoking an operator, specifying, you know, what this address is an operator for, and then sending stuff um, by the operator, and then various events and minting and burning and authorizing operators and revoking operators. 
Um, there's two fo functions I want to take a quick look at in this specification. One of them is a interface ERC-77 token sender that has a function tokens to send in it. This particular uh, interface is required for any address that wants to be notified of um, or to handle or to prevent the debit of tokens. So this is uh, so the address for the contract that implements the interface uh, is going to have to be registered with another ERC, which is 820. And then the other interface to take a look at is the ERC this is a token recipient uh, specification. Uh, and the implementation of that interface is required for any address wishing to be notified, handle, or reject the reception of tokens. Um, so this is kind of similar to the sender. It's just focusing on the recipient side. Um, and only one token sender and only one token recipient can be registered per, registered per address, uh, basically doing the debit and reception of ERC-777 token transfers. Uh, so, um, you know, a specific token can be identified in these functions. So, you know, they're, they're specific uh, sender and recipient for those particular tokens. Uh, on the other hand, the same token sender and token recipient hooks could be registered for multiple addresses and the hooks can distinguish which who are the sender and the recipients using the from and the two parameters up here you know address from and address to all right so erc 777 and 223 were really attempts just to uh, modify ERC-20 and give it some greater capabilities. Let's take a look at what is probably the, mo the second most popular ERC after ERC-20, which is ERC-721, the non-fungible token standard, sometimes called the deed standard. Uh, the ERC-721 uh, is, for, is a standard for non-fungible tokens, um, sometimes referred to as deeds. Non-fungible tokens uh, are tracking ownership of unique thing. Um, and this is very different from how ERC-20 worked, because ERC-20 didn't track the provenance of a specific item. It just, you know, checked how many tokens you have. Now we're going to track the provenance of a specific item. Now, and it's intended to reflect the ownership of property, like real estate, uh, even though it's not technically, you know, you know, smart contracts aren't technically uh, legal documents. Um, Non-fungible tokens, uh, track this ownership of a unique thing. The thing owned can be a digital item, such as a magical sword in a game. It can be a digital collectible, like um, a digital artwork. It can be um, a reference to a physical item. You know, we could use a non-fungible token to be a reference to a physical art or a physical car or physical real estate. And, and then we could track that real estate ownership through the token, such as owning a house, a car, artwork, and so on. So deeds can also represent things with negative values, such as a loan or a debt or, you know, a lien or an easement. Um, and so the non-fungible token standard ERC-721 places no limitation or expectation on the nature of what we're tracking uh, and requires only that can be uniquely identified using the equivalent of like a social security number. So all you need is some unique ID and then you can track it. Uh, and in particular, we're using a 256-bit identifier as our unique identifier. Um, so you can take a look at the details of the standard uh, it, you know, in uh, GitHub. Um, but let's take a look at the big primary difference between ERC-20 and ERC-721. Oh, here's an example, by the way, before we get to that. Um, here is one of the recent NFTs that sold last year. Crypto Kitty Nana Me Butt is this uh, little artwork of a cat, cat and it's collectible and it's sold for over $150,000. All right, so let's take a look at um, the ERC-721 data structure. The big difference between ERC-721 and ERC-720 is the mapping that is used. So in ERC-721, you can see um, we're mapping a unique identifier to an address. And basically, so you imagine this is the, you know, the equivalent of the social security number or whatever for that particular object. Then we say, well, this object, you know, whatever number it is, let's say number 17 is owned by this address. Now this is the opposite uh, of 
what we saw with the balances token. So when we were dealing with ERC-20 tokens, which are fungible tokens, um, we saw an address over on the left being mapped to a UNT-256 on the right. So in that case, we had an address on the left and we had their, their total number of tokens they owned on the right. In this case, we have this unique identifier on the left and then we have the address that owns that identifier on the right. So that's kind of the difference, you know, um, instead of tracking balances, now we're you know, associating the addresses with these unique items. All right, so let's take a look at the specification for the ERC721. Uh, so we've got some uh, events and functions, um, kind of similar to what we saw with uh, ERC20, but a little bit different. So we've got a transfer function to transfer, um, you know, who owns this object to someone else. Uh, we've got a function balance of, uh, we got an owner of to return who owns that item. Uh, we got a transfer, transfer from, and then we got some approves to approve the, uh, the transfers. Um, so it's basically pretty straightforward. You know, who owns it and can we, how do we transfer it? There's a couple of optional interfaces to help support it. Uh, first one's for metadata. It's got a function, a name, a symbol, and a deed, a URI. Um, you know, you can use the URI to kind of locate the object if it's not on the blockchain. Uh, you can say, hey, this is where you go find the blockchain off the item off the blockchain. Name and symbol, you know, just to kind of represent the item, just kind of like with the ERC20 token. Uh, we also have an enumeration interface uh, we can use to get some more information about what's going on, like how many owners are there, an index, uh, owner by index, and so on. Total supply for the tokens. All right, so that was a high level look at several of the additional ERC. Uh, standards for tokens beyond ERC-20, the fungible token standard. Let's talk in general about token standards though. Uh, so we've talked about several different token standards ranging from the fungible and non-fungible tokens to some extensions to fungible tokens. So what's the goal of these standards? I mean, if you're gonna create your own token, should you use the standards? How should you use them? Should you add functionality beyond the standards? Uh, what standards should you use? So here's some of the questions I wanna talk about. So the first thing is, is that, um, you know, token standards have a purpose. They're intended to be the minimum specification for an implementation. What that means is that in order to be compliant with say ERC-20, you need to be at minimum implement all the functions and behavior in that interface that's specified by the ERC-20 standard. Uh, you can, you're free to add any additional functionality you want by implementing any functions you want that are not part of the standard and just adding them in. The primary purpose of these standards is to encourage interoperability between smart contracts. Uh, therefore, all wallets, exchanges, user interfaces, and other infrastructure components can interface in a predictable manner with any contract that follows a specification. So in other words, if you deploy a contract that follows the ERC-20 standard, all existing wallet users can seamlessly start trading your token without having to make any modifications to their wallet. Uh, so given all these standards, each developer faces a dilemma. Use the existing standards or innovate beyond the restrictions that, this, that are imposed by the standards. This dilemma is not easy to resolve. Standards necessarily restrict your ability to innovate by creating this sort of narrow road that you have to follow. On the other hand, the basic standards have emerged from experience with thousands of applications and often fit well with the vast majority of use cases. So as part of this consideration, uh, an even bigger issue is the value of interoperability and broad adoption. If you choose to use an existing standard, you gain the value of all the systems designed to work with that standard. If you choose to depart from the standard, you have to consider the cost of building all the support infrastructure on your own uh, or persuading others to support your implementation as a new standard. The tendency to forge your own path and exhaust existing standards is known as not invented here. Um, and it's really contrary to the spirit of open source software. But on the other hand, progress and innovation sometimes depend on departing from tradition. So it's a, quite a choice you have to uh, consider carefully. Just remember that standards are meant to be descriptive rather than prescriptive. 
How you choose to implement those functions is entirely up to you. The standard is really giving the, the, this, this method signature. So for interoperability purposes, interoperability purposes, we know what you have to call. How, what it does is really up to the developer. So, um, so as with smart contracts, when you're deciding what standards to leverage, you really need to think about uh, what are the benefits and drawbacks to using that particular standard. So there are a number of extensions uh, that people have considered go, uh, and things that they've considered when they go beyond the standard. Uh, but when you decide to uh, implement uh, a system, you know, say, for example, you're implementing your own token um, and whether or not you decide to base it on the standard, um, there's a number of reference implementations out there um, that you could work from or you could write your own from scratch. Again, this choice represents a dilemma that can have serious security implications. Existing reference implementations of code are battle tested. While it's impossible to prove that any particular code example is secure, uh, a code example that's been used many times, um, you know, may have been used many, many times in a production scenario and have been attacked repeatedly and vigorously. And if there no significant vulnerabilities have been discovered so far, it's it re represents a level of investment that could benefit you significantly. Writing your own code is not easy. There are many subtle ways that a smart contract can be compromised, as we saw in our earlier lectures on security. Um, so it's much safer to use a well-tested, widely used reference implementation. For example, like the Open Zeppelin implementations of the ERC-20 standard. Um, if you use an existing implementation, you can also extend it, adding again your own functionality. Again, however, be careful with that impulse to write your own code. Complexity in a, a smart contract is the enemy of security. Every single line of code you add expands the potential vulnerability of your contract and could be problematic. You may not notice a problem until you put a lot of time and effort into your contract and someone comes along and breaks it. So standards and implementation choices are important parts of overall secure smart contract design. Um, so here are some potential extensions to token interface standards that people have been working on. Uh, you know, the token standards that we took a look at provided a very minimal interface with limited functionality. And many, many projects have added additional capabilities. So some of these additional capabilities are in areas of like owner control, the ability to give specific addresses or sets of addresses, uh, special capabilities such as blacklisting, whitelisting, multi-signatures, minting, recovery, and so on. Uh, burning tokens, the ability to deliberately destroy or burn tokens by transferring them to an unspendable address or by erasing a balance and reducing the supply. Minting, the ability to add to the total supply of tokens, either at a predictable rate or just uh, by uh, an increase uh, when authorized by the creator of the token. Crowdfunding, the ability to offer tokens for sale, for example, through an auction, a market sale, reverse auction, and so on. Uh, caps, the ability to set predefined and immutable limits on the total supply. Um, recovery backdoors, you know, functions to enable an owner to recover funds, reverse transfers, or dismantle the token that can be activated by a designated address or set of addresses. Whitelisting, the ability to restrict tokens or actions on those tokens like token transfers to specific addresses. Uh, this is most commonly used to offer tokens to accredited investors after vetting by the rules of a particular jurisdiction. Uh, and there may be a mechanism for updating the whitelist and adding addresses in or removing them. Blacklisting, the ability to restrict token transfers by disallowing specific addresses. Uh, and there's usually a function for updating the blacklist. Um, and there are reference implementations for, and standards for many of these functions, for example, in the Open Zeppelin library. Some of these functions are use case specific and only implement a few tokens. Um, and so this decision to extend a token standard with additional functionality, like some of the areas we talked about here, represents a trade-off between the innovation, uh, risk, and interoperability and security. 
I've mentioned initial coin offerings a few times previously. Uh, you know, tokens have been an explosive development in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, and they're likely to become a very important component of all smart contract platforms like Ethereum. Uh, and the importance and future impact of these standards should not be confused with an endorsement of any particular token offering. Uh, as in any early stage technology, uh, the first wave of products and companies are going to be high risk and there will be many, many failures, including some spectacular failures. Uh, and there are many token offerings that um, are, you know, pyramid schemes and money grabs. So the trick is to separate the long term vision and impact of the technology, which is likely to be significant from the short term bubble of token initial coin offerings, which may include some fraud and scams. Uh, token standards in the platform should survive the current token mania and can have a massive impact on the world. So in summary, tokens are a very powerful concept in Ethereum and can form the basis of many important decentralized applications. So we took a look at different types of token standards and we saw some examples of building tokens. Uh, 